Good morning, everyone. You know, uh, Dr. Sri Wahid mentioned uh, mobile data at 384 kilobits per second. I still remember 14.4 uh, kilobit per second dial-up internet in the early 90s. That's how I started off. And you know, we've come a long way since 2010. We've had fiber. And you know, globally, we've seen a big shift in terms of the construct of the industry. And now we're talking about uh, you know, everybody wants connectivity. We need it. And I think, you know, unfortunate, fortunately or unfortunately, COVID has potentially accelerated the need and the want for connectivity and services and digitalization of the economy as such. But, and, you know, that brings us to the hottest topic in the, in the sector these days, which is around 5G. Uh, it brings reduced latency much faster throughputs, but the big issue is how do we afford to do all of this? And I think I'm very glad to hear what our esteemed minister had to say about getting the foundations right. And to that effect, you know, we have the key players uh, in bringing together the base infrastructure, which is wireline, because at the end of the day, whether it's 4G, 5G, or in the future 6G, what we're doing is, yes, the last mile is going to be wireless, but we are going to need wire closer and closer to the consumer. So we have with this the key people behind providing that wire to the industry, right? So we have the regulator. Thank you, Chairman Dr. Fazl, for joining us today. Uh, we have the CEOs of the two main providers of fiber optic cable in the country and backhaul services. So we have uh, Imri Mokhtar from Telecom Malaysia, as well as dialing in Afzal Abdurrahim, the CEO of Time.com. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. So I think what we'll you, do Bob, is, yes. against that backdrop and what the minister has just said, uh, we, we I will just pose this question out to you guys first, which is, what is, in your view, what is the role of 5G in the greater plans of the country? It used to be called the National Fiberization and Connectivity Plan. Now we've moved on to Jandela. But how do we ensure an effective and efficient rollout of network to meet this goal? Maybe we could start off with uh, Dr. Fazul first on this topic. Good morning, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Prem, for the question. Uh, esteemed friends in the audience, and Wat Mantri. I think, first and foremost, I think let's look at um, the whole thing, um, this new animal named Jandela. Okay? Uh, it's actually not a really new <coughs> animal. Uh, we've had this National Fiberization and Con Connectivity Plan before, okay? but what we didn't have in the planning for an NFCP was COVID-19. <coughs> okay? And COVID-19 happened, we realised that the aspiration and the targets that we set for ourselves under the NFCP uh, just wasn't enough. People were consuming data at a higher pace, you know, a lot more voracious than they used to, and they were also uh, consuming it at different places than it was then planned for, and as such, the industry came together with the ministry, uh, with MCMC, and many other government agencies to figure out what's next. And that what's next is Jandela. Right? So when you talk about 5G, you certainly need to have a solid foundation before 5G happens. Uh, many of us who are in the telco space uh, have seen. I know that Wahid, then now Tansu Wahid. Uh, we said, yeah, 384. Okay. <laughs> now, 384, and we said, 384? What's that? Okay. So everybody wants 100 meg, 300 meg, 1 gig. Okay. So that is the kind of demand that we have today. And as such, when you talk about uh, mobile networks per se, we've seen networks move from 2G to 3G to 4G. Let's just analyze our own experience as a consumer. From 2G to 3G, we saw the upside. We felt the upside. Okay? We didn't feel there was a lack of quality of service at that point in time. Okay? Because 
from just a simple SMS, you could do a lot more things. Then we moved from 3G to 4G. And then we started to find that we had pockets of quality of experience. Have we ever asked, why did, ha did that happen? Could it be a technical issue? Could it be an investment issue? It's probably both. Okay? So now imagine if we were to just jump into 5G with the same set of pro, uh, you know, uh, issues, we will find that we will have a poorer quality of experience. And therein lies the concern. Okay? Because when anything is being invested, you want people to benefit from the investment, you want the industry to get the returns on the investment. And hence, Jandela came into the picture so that we can have a measured approach towards 5G. And with 5G, we cannot just look at 5G strictly from a mobile space because mobile space is up there in the air. If you have a nice 5 to 10 lane highway up there and you have only a 2 lane highway down here, the net experience would be a 2 lane highway. And that is the very reason you need to talk about uh, fix or fiber. All right? And that, there, thereof, you have a 10 lane highway down here on the ground, you have a 10 lane highway up in the air, the net uh, experience would be a 10 lane highway experience. And that is precisely what Jandela is meant to achieve. Okay? And given that the size of Malaysia, we are not uh, as small as some countries that we can do it overnight, uh, we have a, a very diverse uh, set of geographical uh, logistics. Okay? And, that, and hence, uh, people say, oh, it takes you a year and a half? Why not in six months? I wish, and I'm sure the industry too wishes the same, that we can all do this in six months, but we need to be realistic that there will be areas where it will take more than six months. Okay? So, and, and the industry has committed itself to the Jandela. That's the beauty of the Jandela. It is not a government's plan. It is actually a plan by the industry. Yes, it has been pushed as much as possible, uh, as they say, pushing the envelope as much as possible to the industry. And the industry has resoundingly accepted the challenge. And they had committed to the uh, targets that you will see in Jandela, which uh, will be uploaded for everyone to see, to analyze, okay? Uh, and it will always be refined, given that as you go down to the ground, things may need to uh, be tinkered here and there. But generally, that is the target, and I thank the industry for stepping up, because they will be the ones who, who will be delivering this. And I'm just, the regulator and, and the other government agencies, we're just the guys that will help monitor, prod, and occasionally have the stick uh, to make sure that the industry delivers. To the, to the to the end users like you and I. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fazl. Sorry for putting you on the spot, Avery, <laughs> but um, since your regulator has spoken first, what are your thoughts on the same issue? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Prem. Um, first and foremost, uh, congratulations, Amr uh, Minister, as well as uh, Dr. Fazl, Chairman of MCMC, for the announcement of uh, Jandela by the uh, our Prime Minister. And uh, when, we, when we look at uh, what is the blueprint set forward for, for the industry uh, in terms of uh, for the country, yeah, in, ter in terms of the various phases, the one thing we can appreciate is the technology agnosticness of it, right? I think what's fundamental is it's really of providing the connectivity to all formulations, a uh, much more inclusive plan where we could connect not just in terms of all the users, whether it's household, businesses, or even government uh, in the city areas, but also into the remote and rural. I think that is the, the baseline of what um, Jandela is, is, is setting out to be. And, and that is a prerequisite for our country to the point that was raised by the minister, uh, that uh, the, co the connectivity was going to be a prerequisite for us mm -hmm. towards... Uh, enabling a much more digital Malaysia, right? The plans have been, to, we look forward to, to the second or third week of this month to hear of that plan, but uh, it's, uh, that's something that uh, for the industry is, yeah. is the role that we play, right? In terms of providing that connectivity. And it, it will be a mix. It will be a mix of uh, technology of uh, fit for purpose uh, for the various geographies, for the various uh, sectors, 
whether it's going to be fixed as well as mobile, you know, in, in a broader sense. Yeah? Uh, for the fix, um, here, you know, uh, we heard earlier on the chairman of Bursa mentioned that he was part of the launch of uh, 3G, but also many would, uh, would just like to also acknowledge yeah, Tan Sri Wahid was, was an architect of HSBB as well. Yeah? Uh, so, and uh, that was the path that Telecom Malaysia we had undertaken yeah, uh, in the public and the private partnership together with the government back then, and that, uh, that journey has, has continued. Yeah? Um, as uh, we know, there are also, you know, uh, fakes of fiber needs to be complemented by wireless or mobile. And uh, today we are in the 4G, very happy to hear that uh, the, the focus in terms of optimizing that uh, current 4G uh, infrastructure from a coverage as well as a quality of experience, which sets the baseline for, for 5G in the future. Uh, for us at TM, we see um, in terms of the technology to be both an area that we are committed to be part of from the fix in the fiber as well as from the wireless, particularly with wireless broadband to complement connectivity uh, for homes, for businesses, where it could be a bit of a challenge yeah, due to various considerations to, uh, to really uh, provide fiber services. Um, fixed wireless today, I'm sure, would be a very much more uh, a greater experience with, uh, with 5G later. Yeah? So I, I, I think that is what the, the playbook uh, is ahead for us, a much more technology agnostic connectivity, mm -hmm. um, which would enable a much more digital society, digital business, and a digital government in a much more inclusive digital economy for Malaysia. Thank you, Imri. Afzal, thanks for joining us online. Um, what Thank are your thoughts around me. this? Around 5G in general? Um, 5G I, and... I have, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have a, uh, perhaps a slightly uh, a different standpoint about uh, 5G. Um, I'll come to that in a second, but I think the main thing is that uh, we've done a lot of work in the past six weeks or so um, at the National Digital Infrastructure Labs, where I think teams uh, across all the telcos as well as MCMC um, have spent, you know, literally nine to five time to try and work out the granular details for how we roll out the infrastructure of the future um, and services of the future. Um, I think in particular, uh, Dr. Fazul has put us under the whip um, insofar as ensuring the consumers, um, and he's quite, known, he's quite well known for that, I must tell you, Prem, um, uh, for, for, basic, for, for basically measuring uh, performance from the consumers in a meaningful manner. Um, you know, everything from website load times to, you know, how many rings, you know, we pick up in call centers, which, as you know, many of us got fined for a couple of weeks ago. By the previous chair, a few months ago, so I, I I think it's I think it's nice to see MCMC really um, uh, sort of t tightening the screws on us because I think us telcos have had it easy for quite a while. Um, the key output of the digital infrastructure labs um, have really been a coordinated and granular um, coordination for how we're going to roll things out. Right. So if you just take TM and us. You know, we've basically looked at, you know, how, how best we can sort of roll out infrastructure and fiber infrastructure to expand the two-lane highway to a five-lane highway, right? And sometimes, just to take Dr. Fazol's analogy even further, it's not so much about a, a two-lane highway at the bottom, it's about building an interchange or a toll plaza next to the, next to the two-lane expressway that is already five-lane, right? So this is, the, this is the, the bigger issue. And as you know, when you start wanting to build toll plazas and interchanges, um, the, biggest, the biggest hindrance to this are these very painful people called the local authorities um, who sort of act as, uh, you know, sort of landlords um, and warlords in, 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 in delaying the rollout of infrastructure across the country. Um, that in itself is probably the largest hindrance or the biggest roadblock that we're going to have to rolling out infrastructure. Um, if, for example, the telcos had blanket permits um, adhering to traffic management, adhering to safety and security, we could probably um, uh, almost half the time it takes to deploy infrastructure around the country. Um, and it's that permitting issue with the various local authorities and councils and states which really causes an issue. And this is where I think that our minister has taken the lead um, in, 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 in ensuring that we can move towards 
um, a federalized version perhaps um, of uh, housing and local government acts as well as local permitting acts. Um, finally, insofar as 5G is concerned, I think it's very important to separate the myth from reality. Um, the 5G is a technological evolution that we all look forward to and we believe will provide us with um, the proper utilization of spectrum or better, more efficient utilization to serve masses, rural areas, etc. Let's not confuse it with this, uh, uh, this 5G sort of scam which the GSMA is sort of putting across um, and putting around the world like as if it's going to cure cancer, right? Um, 5G is a, is, is a technical evolution. Um, it will help us reach various places around the place, uh, but it's certainly not uh, the silver bullet. Um, and I think that we need to think about, as what Dr. Fazl said, um, you know, all the contributing factors or the tributaries of the river rather than just this river of 5G change. Interesting topic around red tape and how that has uh, hindered the rollout of network uh, in an efficient manner over the years. Uh, I suppose for Dr. Fazl, maybe if you turn back to you, that there was a plan by the MCMC to essentially make permitting for the rollout of network essentially a one-stop shop. How has that gone and you know, what are the challenges in actually implementing this around the country? Yeah, many years ago, um, we saw this problem, okay, uh, having to go through far too many doors, uh, and we established a mechanism called the, uh, the one-stop agency, the OSA, if you want, okay. Uh, there had been some initial challenges, but after you know, a lot of refinement, I think many states, that seems to be working quite nicely, which means an, an applicant comes in, meets this entity, and this entity then deals with the local authorities. Now, that problem has been solved, but then there's a new problem that comes at the back, okay, where, as Afzal pointed out, uh, the local authorities have a slightly different view of life, okay, where uh, they will feel that there is value for them to create, uh, to be created out of the deployment of telco infrastructures. And thereof, you find uh, the fees structure being a bit uh, uh, a challenge. Okay? Uh, second, sometimes the process of the local authority is also a challenge because there are uh, matters related to land uh, uh, issues around in the state, which also takes a bit of time. So, hence, that has been problem. Now, moving forward, I think what, to me, the best way is for all states to adopt an approach whereby take a philosophy that telecommunications cannot be a legat service. Now, when you go into a new development area, what happens is that water and electricity is seen as a utility, and therefore it gets planned right up front when you plan for a new development area. As opposed to telecommunications, you only come in when people have actually moved in. And then, then you have a problem. Okay? There are areas even till today where people have moved in for a good 10 years, telecommunication services is still not there the way they, they want it. So by making telecommunications a utility, automatically you then have a model whereby the development plan actually identifies water, electricity, and telecommunications. And telecommunications takes in in three forms. One, what goes underground, which is the laying of the fiber. What can be set, which is going to be for the towers. So there'll be dedicated sites uh, pre-planned for towers to come up, which then allows for a lot more sharing of, of such towers. And third, possibly even areas uh, on rooftops, which may require some additional equipments to be located for. So when that sort of planning is put up front, service providers can come in quite easily even before the people come in. And when people come into the newly open uh, area, they find that all it, uh, they just have to bring themselves and next thing you know, the devices are easily connected, uh, electricity is available, water is available. And that is the approach that we are now taking. We're going, uh, in fact, uh, with the help of the minister, uh, myself and a few others, we are going to we are meeting with the respective uh, chief ministers, the respective Basas, to alert them of this need for them to appreciate that telecommunications today 
is a utility. It, yeah. It's no longer just telecommunications being telecommunications. So that is the approach that we have uh, to, uh, to take today. So OSA is nice, but I think there's another set of issues that we need to, deliver, uh, to, to solve, and that is probably a lot more fundamental, which is actually trying, uh, looking at telecommunications as a utility. I mean, that, that's very interesting. In fact, it sounds like some form of an enactment of law that needs to be made. Yes. Do you think we will see this in the near term, or do you think it's too many hurdles? My view is that uh, it's a prerequisite on people like myself uh, and those in the government agencies, uh, as well as the service providers, to convince uh, the stakeholders that there is actually an economic value. Mm. Uh, let me give an example. Today, if you go around in Kuala Lumpur, do you realize that if you step into a F&B outlet that is more than 200 square feet in size, Wi-Fi is readily available? We never ask, how come is that? Why is that so? Okay, because it wasn't so, say, 10 years ago, all it took was the then mayor, Tan Sri Fuad, who asked me and said, is it so costly to, to fix uh, Wi-Fi in, in there? People tell me it takes you a thousand, two thousand ringgit. I said, sir, all I need is just 200 ringgit to kickstart that. I said, how come? Hence, I gave telecoms uh, entry package for, for broadband, which is then Unify and what it takes to buy a router from Laoyat. And I told him, that's it. He said, oh, is that cheap? I said, yes. And what happened was that they then, DBKL then changed the business license that they do it on an annual basis, that if, you, if a FMB outlet, for you to get your annual business license renewed, another thing in the checklist is a Wi-Fi availability. And there you have, for us as consumers, Wi-Fi becomes synonymous with any FNB. You don't. You step into an FNB. I can assure you, you will have Wi-Fi there, okay? And you don't even have to pay for it nowadays, right? You just go in. Either you need to have a password, or it's an open access for any customer. So it can be done. I'm not saying it cannot be yes. done, but it takes a lot of communications with the stakeholders for them to appreciate the upside to the uh, to them, okay? But be it economically or for convenience. That's very interesting to know. I never knew that we had to have the Wi-Fi in these establishments. <laughs> I mean, that, that's an interesting solution to a bigger problem. You know, l let me just switch gears a little bit. You know, if we look at broadband connectivity in this country, yes, the big number is 3.3 .3 million um, fixed broadband connections in the country. But if we were to dissect that and just took all those connections which are 30 megabits and above, that number falls to about 2.1 million, which gives us about 20 plus percent household penetration, thereabouts. And what we realize is it's the center of the country which seems to be lacking a lot of connectivity solutions. For the operators, I'm gonna pose this to Imri and Avzal, what are the challenges for you guys in taking this further? And I'll start with you, Imri, given that Telecom Malaysia actually has a fair amount of uh, its nodes already fiberized. What are your challenges? And does this mean that we need to pull more wire or are wireless solutions also part of the whole agenda here? Yeah. Um, I believe that it is, it is gonna be a portfolio of both, right? Um, if you were to recall back um, when uh, many years ago when, the, when TM embarked on the HSBB rollout, it was, it was, uh, it was a conscious uh, joint decision with the government then yeah, for it to be uh, supply driven. And after the end of that phase now, uh, the next um, phase of us is gonna be very much, much more targeted. It will be much more de demand driven and uh, when we speak about demand-driven and also targeted rollout, regardless whether it's going to be from, from a fiber or potentially next after this, uh, part of the phase one of uh, Jandela, uh, wireless broadband, say, um, it needs to look at from, from the lens of the market. 
right? Um, and uh, from the National Digital Infrastructure Lab, the one month or uh, five weeks that we had, you know, we really went to a very granular level. Uh, I think one of the points that was mentioned by the minister just now of Tendale is that that's a detailed mapping of what's on the ground. Yeah? We have to have much more targeted. Uh, one example that we had showcased was uh, in the area of, uh, of bunting. Yeah? Mm. Uh, two that's already been fiberized, but when really deep dive, one of the other areas from uh, the profile, the demographics, the occupancy of those areas from a residential, from a business area, we need to balance that, right? Do we fiberize or is there an alternative that's a bit more efficient, but yet providing a much more better quality of experience, mm. which may then dovetail into wireless broadband per se. So, so it's moving forward, it's, there are clear plans yeah, from, uh, as Afzal had mentioned, uh, we had uh, a joint plan of all the, uh, when it comes to the fiberization yeah, over the next uh, few years, right up till 2021, uh, sorry, 2022, uh, up to 7.5 million yeah, of uh, premises, yeah, of residential as well as businesses. But um, is the beyond that, right? Yes that we need to, to figure out how best to. Yeah? It, it needs to balance uh, this be in terms of that cost of investment and, and fair returns as well to the service providers, yet also providing that connectivity. Uh, I would like to also circle back just now uh, what Afzal had mentioned, the challenges that we are facing today when it comes to time to roll out that it will take as well as the cost of investment. Yeah? Um, some challenges we are facing today with uh, with our friends at the local authorities, but we need to take a step back and understand what is it that we are trying to achieve here by providing that connectivity. It's, it's about elevate, it's, it's about uh, bridging that digital divide. It's really about bridging as well that income divide that we are seeing. Uh, last week, I was very much enlightened. Uh, Serena is here, you know, uh, had the great opportunity uh, to, uh, to have a sit down with, uh, with MDEC. And it's amazing some of the programs that they've done. I think I would just like to mention, and probably so you, know, you, you would elaborate a bit further later during your panel session, on a program called PADAS. Yeah? Mm. What connectivity, what we do in the industry allows, right? Elevates the quality of life of a Malaysian. Yeah? PADAS was one of the showcases, was this, uh, is the Perkhidmatan e Dagang Setempat for community. Uh, there was this one lady, young lady, 32 year old in the Kuala Lipis, Spahang. Yeah, she, she, was, uh, she sells these crackers, right? Mm -hmm. the vegetable crackers, you know, being able to sell about 300 ringgit a month. But with the connectivity, going on social commerce and so forth, her latest income is about 2,800 a month. So you, you imagine that, right? What we do, uh, the impact yeah, yes. to the socioeconomic of, of the country. And if we were to see it from that perspective, then we would really see this as a utility, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's an essential, it's, it's just like oxygen for, for, the, for society and businesses. And uh, so I, I think that's something I'd just like to share here. Sure. <laughs> Afzal, what are your thoughts around this? Um, well, first of all, Prem, I just want to push back again on your cheeky yeah. number of 20%. Um, it's yeah. not 20%, far it's more nice. than that. Um, uh, you know, there are 9 million postal addresses, as Dr. Fazul and MCMC has educated us, and that's been the kind of denominator um, that we have. Uh, there's, there's the, and, 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 so that, and so at the moment, uh, there certainly is more than 20% broadband take up, whether high speed or otherwise. Uh, we, can, we can kind of do the math later. Um, so how are we going to connect the rest, I think, is your question, right? I mean, how are we going to get to the rest? Um, so it's a, look, I mean, I, I hate to admit it, but HSBB in its first, in its first iteration, at least for infrastructure um, layout, um, uh, was a public-private partnership which excluded other parties, uh, but it worked. Um, you know, infrastructure was laid out. Okay, TM is not very fast as usual, but, you know, they did deliver um, the the what was said to, to deliver, which is X number of homes. And my concern is that over the past few years, if you look at the number of net additions um, to new premises rolled out, that number has dwindled. And that is again because as a country, um, there, are, there, are, there are levers that we can push. We can push the performance lever, we can push the price lever, we can push the quality lever, um, and we can push the coverage lever. But we can't always push all four levers at once. 
What is clear what Malaysia needs to push on today is a coverage lever and a performance lever. Um, you know, and I think that's what we've kind of been aligned in in the digital infrastructure lens. Uh, that we've talked a little bit about prioritizing these two levers. Um, you know, if Dr. Fazul is able to arm twist the mayor, you can imagine what he can do to his own licensees, whose licenses he renews by signature. Um, and so he's basically made it very clear to us that he expects us to expand coverage um, to, uh, to, to, to focus on that um, kind of moving forward. Now, um, expanding coverage, we need to make use of strengths. Now, I think that we need to really, you know, understand how best we can upgrade the existing people with infrastructure. So I'll go back to, and, and now Imri is going to make fun of me, I'm going to go back to our Banting example, uh, as in uh, Banting and Slango, um, of Kampong 1, Kampong 2, and Kampong 3. So this is one of the examples that as the CEOs of the industry, we collectively spend a lot of time on speaking about how we could connect uh, three effectively uh, 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 housing estates and kampongs, which are within only a four kilometer radius of each other. So Kampong One, and I know Dr. Fazul remembers the name and I don't, uh, essentially has 4G connectivity, has Unify, um, and also uh, uh, has got pre-Unify on its edges, right? Kampong Two has 4G connectivity and Unify, and Kampong Three has got 4G connectivity and pre-Unify. Now, what you'd be interested to see is that in the areas, it just so happened where there is Unify available, the take-up was actually pretty low. If you correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was something like 8 or 9% uh, of, the, of the install base of the households um, involved. So sometimes the issue is not just about making sure the infrastructure is available. Sometimes the issue is about reallocating infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, across these three areas that are adjacent to each other. So that, that every district and every area requires a specific plan to ensure that the Rakyat can get connectivity, right? Um, and so what we decided towards the end is that rather than us focus on pushing out more unified ports or more HSBB ports uh, for fixed broadband, that then we would we, we, we would instead focus on fiberizing the base stations in those areas so the mobile operators could provide the service to Kampong 3, right, Dr. Fazula, if I'm not mistaken? Yes. And that's what we decided on. So and there are thousands of each of these of such kampongs around the country. So you can imagine the massive scale of coordination. Um, I'm just very, very glad that we are now doing this coordination in the recent months. Um, yeah, that was that's my view. Thank you, Absal. I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting point because in my view, 5G in its first instance for emerging markets is essentially going to be for the provision of fixed wireless access to a lot of households which are outside of the key urban centers, right? And even in some urban centers where it's too expensive to pull wire, it brings an alternate, uh, alternative uh, modes of providing high-speed broadband. The question then is, what is a threat to the fixed line operators? How Do you see this as a threat or an opportunity um, if 5G comes along and provides part of this uh, replacement for fiber, so to speak? Imri? Yeah, I, as I, be, I, I believe that it's, you know, if you were to look more from the from the market lens, right? It's it's an option. It's an option yes. that's provided to, to the customers, whether it's for a premise, you know, you, it's more fixed, but when you step up for your premise, whether it's a home or it's your office, then it's, it's on your mobile, right? And wanting a greater experience of it. Uh, today is 4G, later it's 5G and so forth. Um, and uh, well, for for TM, it's it's, it's both an, it's, it's an opportunity as well. Yeah? as um, as we lay out uh, the, the fiber, say, uh, to the premises yeah, uh, under the Jindela program, um, it also provides opportunity for us to, to collaborate with the industry in terms of uh, fiberizing the, the back hall as well, mm. right? Um, so that's one. And there are also other points of interest within a community in terms of uh, fibering up uh, the schools, right? The, in terms of the police stations and so forth. So. So I, I think the uh, the investment has got a lot of, of legs yeah, for TM when it comes to fiber. It's not just about uh, fiberizing the nine million uh, premises. Yeah, there are other 
segments and sectors that we can use it, and particularly in terms of supporting uh, 5G. Yeah? Uh, fiberizing the backhaul is, is something that we are very much open to, to discuss with uh, our friends from the, uh, from the uh, mobile space yeah? to provide. Yes. So an opportunity indeed. Yeah. And Avzo? Um, so yeah. I think that 5G is to the mobile operators uh, what Tesla and the rest are to, de to the Detroit automakers, right? Um, so it depends how you approach it. Uh, we can either kind of evolve our services. I think that one of the challenges that uh, Gokan, Imri, and myself has as being fixed broadband providers, and Gokan, I just want to say that since I've subscribed to Maxis Broadband at home, my, my background has turned green. Um, um, I think you better do something about that. I think it's rather unfair um, for you to, you know, uh, prey on free marketing. Um, but what I wanted to say is that the three, what, what the three fiber providers I think have, in, uh, uh, have a distinct challenge with is that um, consumers no longer see us as fixed broadband providers. They see us as home wireless providers. Now, whether they're gaining their connectivity on Wi-Fi uh, or on 4G, 5G or whatever it may be, um, they really don't care. They just want it to work. And that, I think, is the same analog that you'll find in the automotive industry where people just don't, that they, they are far more emissions conscious and far more cost conscious. So it, it, is, it, is, it is certainly a threat, uh, but it raises the game, right? So before this, um, when we were dealing with 4G, the fiber players knew that we had a distinct advantage of 100, 500, maybe even a gig today. Now, the, the truth is that very few services really use more than two or 300 megabits per second, very, very few services, iCloud being one of them. If you, if you all watch your bandwidth at home and your iCloud does its backup towards the end of the day, you know they, that, that it can basically go nuts. Uh, but other than, other than those kinds of services, whether it's high definition video or whatever, you don't get near those speeds. Then it talks about multiple users, right? Um, and that's where I think the, there is an advantage over uh, having fiber closer to the home. So let's just be clear. Whether fiber reaches a base station provided by a mobile operator on 5G 400 meters away from the home, whether fiber reaches a Wi-Fi router or a Wi-Fi access point within the home that's only 10 meters away from you, um, the consumers don't really bother about the technology. They just want it to work. So I think that the closer fiber gets to homes, right, the better chance there is of us serving multiple devices on an array of services and that's what our duty is and today our fiber reaches pretty close to home um, it's just that it takes us you know six months to apply for a permit to dig you know 10 meters um, and I, I i'm sorry for bringing that up but it's just the fact but i i know we're moving in the right direction um, and i wish that more local councils could take it in the spirit of what uh, tan Sri Fuad did uh, with respect to business licenses for example um, so no, it, it is it is it is a, it is a threat, but it makes the fiber operators raise the bar. So we have no choice but to show it. We need to we, we need to basically show a distinct advantage. Of course, because fiber broadband is more expensive to install uh, because of the of the dedicated capex element. So we've also got to justify our price points, and the only way to do so is with performance. Has that philosophy changed going forward? You know, it's a common question amongst foreign investors. And they look at Malaysia. They looked at they look at the uh, financial situation, the budget deficit. The question comes: Could Malaysia go the way of certain other countries in the region and try to tax operators upfront, therefore putting a strain on the actual viability of rollouts for the operators, uh, which then impacts a whole bunch of stakeholders? What are your thoughts around this when it comes to five G in particular? The, when you look at the telco industry, especially in Malaysia, if I look back at the chairman of Brusa and the CEO of Brusa, and you look at the indices of Brusa, you realize that many of our telco players play a huge uh, lever within how Brusa performs, yes. right? And therefore, as a regulator, you have to take cognizance of that. Okay? On one hand, people say, hey, milk as much as you can get from the resources so that the coffers of the government you know, benefits. But at the same time, you're going to strain the operators with inability to invest, strain the operators with poorer ability to provide the right levels of profits, 
And guess what? It then impacts the performance on the bursa, which then impacts the larger market. So that is where the whole balancing act is required. And I think uh, many of uh, the earlier decision makers uh, have taken the wisdom that the fine balance of making sure that there is a fair ability to invest with a fair amount of um, payment for the resources and thereof we have been where we are today. Okay? And I do not think that it has been a bad decision and moving forward is probably going to be the decision forward. Mm -hmm. uh, key is actually to make sure that decision is as transparent as possible. Uh, it's, clear, it's made clear to the uh, investors, uh, to the service providers, and also to the stakeholders, uh, so that people don't muck around and say, aha, aha, there are too many ahas around, okay? So you don't want that, okay? and it has to be very clearly communicated. Today, we are just changing the conversation from talking about the spectrum too early by taking a measured approach. Hey, let's all take, put our hands up and say, yeah, our house was not really in order. Let's fix the house proper. Then we all move forward in tandem. Because Spectrum is just one side of the story to the bigger story. Afzal hit the nail on the head when he said, consumers don't care what technology you use. Consumers only want to be able, the moment I wake up, I open up my device, wherever I am, I'm on it. And I can do whatever I want to do, when I want to do. Okay? So they don't say, oh, I'm here, I'm on a Wi-Fi, oh, I'm here, I'm on a FWA, or I'm on a 5G. They don't. Okay? They just want to use that service. And for a country like ourselves, if we want to get to the uh, level of optimizing and getting the true value of a digital uh, economy, then we must move away from the story of speed. Okay? Yeah. Speed becomes... I mean, let me ask anyone in this room or anyone out there uh, who's uh, watching us, before you take a deep breath, do you ask yourself, what's the level of oxygen? We don't, right? We just breathe, okay? Until we get to a point where you can't breathe and say, okay, maybe oxygen ain't so great here because, oops, I'm probably at 20,000 uh, you know, uh, feet uh, above ground. But otherwise, we don't ask what is the level of oxygen. Likewise, for internet, that should, still, that should be the way. We can do our work without even thinking whether is my speed good for today. And 5G and the gigabit access provides us with that opportunity. And hence, the conversation that we, need all, we all need to talk about is, will be quality of experience. Okay, so once the quality of experience is the level that consumers and businesses understand, speed becomes, you know, just a number, okay? uh, and people won't be too hung up about speed because it's all about process, uh, you know, change management, and stuff like that that actually opens up the whole returns on a digital economy. Okay? So th that is probably yeah. how we will uh, be doing. And coming back to the, your basic question on Spectrum, philosophically and principally, we'll still maintain that good, uh, the wisdom of our forefathers, okay? and we'll move forward with the same. Okay, it's just the timing. I said, again, Jendela sets the tone. Perfect. Thank so, you very much. So I'd just yeah. like to jump in, right, Prem? Sure. Um, you know, for, for the past good period that we've been here, we've been discussing a lot on, on the connectivity part, right? And I would just like to go back to the, to the theme of uh, the Invest Malaysia event today. You know, we talk about advancing Malaysia 5G and Industry 4.0. Uh, so 5G, you know, it's fiber and so forth, that's part of the connectivity. To the point that um, uh, Chairman and uh, CMC had mentioned, yeah, it's what does that oxygen yes. <laughs> you know, allow you to do, which brings us to the industry 4.0. Yeah? Um, we do need uh, an ecosystem you know, that, that creates the demand to, to really pull the need for this connectivity. Right? You know, on one hand, we have Jandela, uh, to, to address that uh, right up to 2022 in phase one and then thereafter that's uh, phase one and phase two and so forth but it's the beyond connectivity that we need to look at collectively as, as a country on how do we get more digital in terms of the um, areas that would move the needle for 
the digital economy, yeah, whether it's at government sure. services, whether it's going to be for businesses, manufacturing, whether it's going to be for society. You know, we've had that example of PADAS that I had mentioned just now. Uh, I, I think that's, that's the other part of the jigsaw that, as a country, that we as a country need, need to, to address yeah, uh, with that blueprint so that it, it really gels well. Yeah? As the industry focuses on the, on the performance, as Azal had mentioned, yeah, the coverage, the quality of experience, it's what goes through that 10 lane highway, regardless whether it's wireless or, or wireline, uh, that would really uh, accelerate us into uh, the digital economy that we aspire to be. It's a good thing that you raise that because one of the questions that's come through on the, uh, from the audience is essentially the changing business model for telcos. Right? As we move forward, is it all just connectivity? Should the fixed line operators like yourselves evolve and start doing things differently? Should you be even investing in other verticals, etc., like what some of your peers have done in other countries? What are your thoughts around that? Well, looking at the beyond the connectivity, clearly this is a wide space. That's, that's, that's a wide spectrum uh, from the various customer segments, from individuals on the mobile, home, SME, enterprise, public sector, and so forth. Um, you know, TM, we have started investing into the, the data centers. Uh, so building on top of those data centers would be the, of that infra, uh, the, the platforms, yeah? the, the cloud platforms, which would enable uh, various uh, cloud applications and services, particularly for public sector as well as enterprises in Malaysia. Uh, one of the uh, enablers uh, to a digital Malaysia is the move towards a more cloud-based. Yeah? When we talk about cloud-based, uh, cyber security is going to be critical. Yeah? Uh, so those are the new areas beyond connectivity that the TM as an organization is moving towards, particularly for the enterprise and the public sector. Uh, we were to, if you we were to look at the consumer space, today a lot of the usage by the consumers is very much entertainment based, and we know that's very much uh, dominated uh, by the global players. Uh, so an area that we believe uh, as a telco that TM can be part of and contribute is, is more within the public sector as well as the enterprise space. Uh, very much based on, on cloud. Yeah. Sure. And Afzal, what do you think about Time's role in trying to evolve the use cases for internet and take it forward? Do you, do you, yeah, I think it's a bit be of a dumb a, pipe or not? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a sad question by you, Prem, because you yeah. know my views on this. Um, yes. Look, I think that telcos have to stop acting entitled. Um, there is a certain amount of entitlement, perhaps amongst the global mobile operators. I think my, my, our Malaysian mobile peers are far more reasonable. But there is a, but there is a, a sense of entitlement that, oh, you know what, YouTube, Facebook, etc., etc., have this revenue. I now want this revenue as well because it's traveling on my pipes. So I've got two analogies to give. Um, you know, uh, Tanaga doesn't expect anyone else uh, to give its revenue because uh, Samsung TV is using electricity. That being the case, you know, why should a telco expect that it can, you know, get revenue from end usage? Um, so that is from the point of view of uh, a, sense of, uh, a sense of entitlement that I think telcos have. I think our duty is to provide good quality pipes. Um, then there's the issue of uh, ability, right? And, 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 and Prem, you've heard this one before, uh, but perhaps it makes the most sense. I mean, let's just, let's, let's just say just because one is, just because we, for example, um, are, a, uh, are a good manufacturer of lingerie uh, doesn't mean, Prem, that you want to see me striking down the catwalk um, in, in a Nike, right? So there are two different skills. One is the production of lingerie and design of lingerie. One is modeling lingerie. Now, I'm sorry to put this image into uh, your heads, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my apologies, Yamohama <laughs> Minister. But that is the fact of the matter. Uh, we are engineers. Uh, we focus on building good quality pipes to serve customers. We need to make sure that when consumers wake up in the morning, their devices work without jitter. Um, and we should basically worry less about other people eating our pie. We should be focusing on providing really good quality services so other people can make money off what we provide. I think that's where it is. I think we will become successful 
if we provide high quality connectivity and there are more and more third parties that jump onto or we create an ecosystem that allows people and when i mean by an, by an ecosystem i don't mean that we get involved in those services that we allow other people to make money from the pipes that we provide because we're being paid for the pipes so i think we need to design and i think every single uh, 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 telco in the world that has tried to veer away from this has paid for it uh, with their kind of balance sheet. Um, so yeah, that's my that's that's my view on that. Maybe Imri would be more attractive in fishnets, but I certainly am not capable. <laughs> I sorry, I forgot to put out the PG eighteen banner on this one. <laughs> you know, with, with Afzal on a panel, should have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to go back to the infrastructure side of things. Right now, I think this is relevant for all three of our panelists. What do you think about trying to make the rollout of network more efficient by essentially creating one infra core upon which the rest of the operators can come up with retail type services? So essentially, the old net core service core model, right? Maybe Dr. Fuzzle <laughs> to start off as the regulator. This is always uh, the, the question uh, that came about even when the days when I was all together with Tan Sri Wahid, uh, you know, doing the HSBB. Um, <clears throat> and many have asked about this InfraCo story. Now, fast forward 10 years, okay? Now, that was how long uh, the story on HSBB has been. Uh, we started the journey in 2008, went live in 2010, and here we are in 2020. And we ask ourselves, has there been a real infra core that has been successful? That should be the most telling answer before we, we ask ourselves, should the infra core be the way forward? We also have to understand that the way the industry has evolved in the country is that uh, we have created a, a decent level of, compet uh, of competitive space. And as a result, we as consumers have got a variety of providers that we can turn to. Okay, um, in fact, better than some countries that has got uh, a population probably hundred times more than us. Okay, yet we have a variety of providers that we can opt for. Yeah, we complain about them not offering the right service from time to time, but generally, do we switch providers on a day-to-day -day basis? Probably not. Okay, therefore, uh, because of that competitive landscape. A lot of infrastructure had been put in the ground. Okay? Now, to move everything into a single infra core, that would certainly jeopardize the whole industry. And you, you don't want that to happen. You have enough problems with the local authorities. Okay? Why add another layer of problem from a regulatory uh, policy? But what is more important is that we must make sure that, one, infrastructure must not be duplicated. Number two, for infrastructure structure that has been deployed, you must allow access to the infrastructure and access to the infrastructure at the right levels of prices. Okay? And to which we have the whole set of regulatory mechanisms today. We've got the access uh, list, we've got the access, uh, review, uh, access pricing review, and in fact, today for HSBB, you have the MSAP, okay? Mandatory Standards of Access Pricing. We have to revisit that every three years, simply because you do not want to use a lever uh, such as that to, then be, uh, to disincentivize in investment. So a lot of things are already in play, and I think we just have to refine and not just say, oh, another prescription is the right prescription for our market. Uh, I think that is the last thing we should be doing, mm. because our market isn't bad. Are we fantastic? We probably have to also say we are not that fantastic. Are we great? We are near great. Okay, so now how do we again make sure that the industry becomes great? Therefore, be it the industry, be it the regulator, be it the government agencies, we all need to come together and speak the same language. And only then you can actually move forward. And I think that is the approach that Jandela has taken. Okay, we don't, uh, without even talking about a single infra co, because there are the right number of people already in the market that will allow us to take it forward without having to muck around and restructure the whole market all over again. Okay. So that's the answer I'm going to give. <laughs> Imri, do you have a differing view on that one? Or 
No, I, I subscribe to the same. I, I think before we look at the um, what are the various uh, options for the industry, you know, we need to be clear on what we are trying to achieve. Yeah? Uh, Jindela had already set out what are the clear targets for the industry to achieve uh, in phase one and phase two. Uh, unless uh, there is um, there's a structural or there's a market failure towards achieving those yeah. uh, coverage as well as performance targets, then you know why why do we need to revisit it? Right, the, yes. the industry structure today, it's um, already on a certain momentum in terms of delivering that. It just needs to be accelerated and boosted uh, with uh, the digital brands and. Uh, I don't see there's, there's a need for us to do that. Yeah. I, I really uh, I support what was mentioned by uh, Dr. Pazo. Sure. And Afzal, you know, I'm, I'm going to modify this slightly for you. Uh, given mm. that you, both yourselves and Telecom Malaysia are involved in providing the backhaul connectivity for base stations in Malaysia, and it was interesting to note that at the end of 2019, only about 40% of base stations were actually fiberized in this country. In your opinion, what do you think has prevented this number from going much higher? Is, is there an issue with pricing, or do you think it's just that nobody had to go to 100% fiber in their uh, mobility networks? Uh, so I think it's a combination of factors, right? Um, I think, first of all, um, let me just dispel the myth that, um, you know, that fiber networks are not available for wholesale. Um, the, the wholesale part of the business is a significant part of Imri's business as it is a part of our business. Um, we've been supporting and fiberizing mobile nodes and aggregation points for uh, more than 10 years now. So I would say for more than a decade, probably from the mid, from the late 2000s, right? So that's the first point I want to put on the table. Um, you know, I think a lot of this also has to do with, uh, with radio frequency planning um, and where the operators see that they have a need for fiber. The mobile operators are always going to feel that our fiber prices are too high and we are always going to feel that we cannot pull to certain areas uh, because of the fact that we cannot make a return on investment for those areas. It's, it's just the normal market tension that one would find. Um, I believe, and I can't quite recall where this has gone, and forgive me for opening up a can of worms, there was a, almost a mandate by the MCMC that uh, when 4G spectrum was given out, it was actually going to be fiber or one hop to fiber. Um, uh, that was implemented, and, and I think that's largely been implemented by most of the mobile operators, if I'm not mistaken, right? So I think that's 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 a key thing, Prem. I mean, not all base stations today require direct fiberization; they need to be within one stop of fiberization, be, between one hop of fiberization. The second thing that I don't think that we don't like talking about, but it's a fact: as much as we have a responsibility uh, to basically providing connectivity around the country. There are certain pockets of rural areas in particular, or you know, semi-rural areas, um, uh, that essentially perhaps do not make it financially viable to fiberize a base station or because you know, demand is quite peaky. So if you look at you know, certain rural areas, whilst it's our responsibility to provide good internet infrastructure, and I'm not making any excuses for the telcos here, if it's only during Balik Kampong season that you know, that infrastructure is fully used, the question is then, you know, how do you match the permanent case of fiberizing a node or an area with a temporal case of peak in usage. So I, I, I think a combination of these things. To take it on the chin, Prem, finally, um, do, can we do a better job? Yes, we can do a better job. And I think the trickery is in the fact that the mobile operators are now expecting the, tel the fixed line operators to go closer to what we call GPON consumer pricing for backhaul um, you know, in order for them to justify fiberizing more nodes, which is difficult because it's a different technology which requires, you know, either 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 synchronous method or Ethernet approach or some other um, uh, uh, technical approach with better quality and availability. So there are some tensions. We can do a better job, but I don't think we're that far off. And if we look at a national service call um, issue, I like to use the UK as the best issue in the world. You know, uh, 17 years ago. Um, Ofcom or Oftel at that point decided that it would be wise to split BT up into three functions and now the UK has got the crappiest broadband um, uh, in Europe and uh, you know Latvia and Estonia are, far, are, are basically far ahead. I, I, I just want to put in a bit of a, of a, of a soundbite into here and I would say that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. 
Um, and I have to be very careful because both regulator and your Muhammad minister and the audience. But the fact of the matter is that let's look at the number, let's see what regulatory model we've chosen and what the requisite investments have been. In 2005, for those of us in the room who were around at the moment, uh, at that point in time, um, you know, we went through a telecommunications strategic review and an and industry review during that time. It was a very meaningful review. Um, and we agreed that we would pursue the overall theme of infrastructure-based competition or pay to play. So if one wanted to provide services, one would need to invest in infrastructure. That has by and large been relatively successful. Um, I take note of what Dr. Fazil says is uh, duplication of infrastructure, which we must prevent, right? Uh, and do a better job of. I think in that the mobile operators have done a better job uh, than the fixed operators. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the last three years, or really since 2017, if you, if you look at it, has seen the lowest investment in rollout, in fixed rollout, um, uh, over the past, uh, over the past uh, 14, 15 years. So, you know, it, it's the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If it's financially viable to roll out, operators will roll out. And, and I think that's what we have to take cognizance of. Perfect. Thank you, Amzal. Very interesting. And you know, while we're talking about the cost of this, you know, the questions that are coming in from the floor are essentially related, a lot of them are related to pricing, right? And you know, we go back to a very painful period two or three years back when we talked about double the speed, half the price. What do we feel around pricing of broadband services in the country today? In the 11th Malaysia plan, we were talking about moving to 1% of GNI, which would have given you a base service line of about 50 ringgit. But I think that was really for a uh, baseline service. But how do we, you know, as industry players within the fixed uh, space, think about pricing as, as it stands? Yeah. Yeah, I think with regards to, to pricing, you know, it's, it's, it's as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to connectivity, it's, it's, uh, it's a portfolio of services, right? Uh, various services, whether it's going to be fiber, whether it's going to be non-fiber, you know, wireless broadband, each has got its own cost base, right? A different cost structure to it. And it's, it's really about balancing uh, a reasonable return, cost and investment to the affordability. I think this, these are the points that needs to be considered. It's, it's a balance, it's a delicate yeah. balance that needs to be looked at holistically rather than on a standalone basis because the implications of it uh, is, is, could be quite significant, right? Uh, in terms of to the, to the shareholders, to the market and, and so forth. So it's, it's something that we, we are only always mindful of in mm. terms of addressing. And uh, I believe that uh, the demand itself, we, we spoke just now about the demand, yeah, would be the one that would also determine it terms of the take up of the service. I would like to share that, for example, for 2020, we've seen a, quite a rapid take up of uh, fixed broadband or fiber broadband, yeah, as uh, more and more are staying at home and in terms of needing a better quality of experience. Yeah. Looking at uh, the first half year of this year in terms of the sign up and the take up, it has accelerated much more as compared over the past two years. So. It really goes back to what we had discussed just now, right? What is the lever for us to drive the adoption in the market? Yeah, uh, price could be one, but it's not the only one. Uh, so that needs to be considered in a holistic manner. Sure, I'm going to pass it on to Avzal before I come back to Dr. Fazil on this topic. Avzal, any thoughts on price yeah, points? Yeah, so I think that there's some natural points. I think that we are a little bit too preoccupied with price points. I think price points in GNI is extremely important for the B40s. And we have a responsibility to deliver, you know, affordable services for that segment. I think that goes without saying. Um, and there are, depending on how you look, uh, pay-as-you-go packages, et cetera, et cetera, amongst the mobile operators um, that, that, that effectively... Um, you know, try to deal with it. Um, the fixed line operators, I think, if we look at the universe today, so let me just talk about the urban example because we're because we're mostly an urban and suburban player, right? So you know, if you look at the example today, we are coming to the point where there are just some people living in apartments, for example, they just don't want fixed broadband. They're very happy with their four G, and they'd be even happier with their five G, because they they feel that's what they need. 
um, and they don't need any more. Some of them are budget balances. Some of them are perhaps a bit more conservative. Maybe a lot of them are, you know, are Penang, uh, 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 Hokkien Penang Knights, uh, which is what we find because we cover Penang quite a while. And the old moniker about being Kiam Siap, I can tell you, is true um, for those Penang Knights in the audience. Um, so, so there are residents who are basically Kiam Siap, and what we should be doing is we should giving them, we should be giving them choice. I think that's what Inri is trying to say. And so the consumer will decide from a demand standpoint, uh, you know, really what they want. Do they want to have a 4G connection or do they want to have a fiber connection? Um, and that's really up to them what they want to choose. And we're seeing that there is, if I had to guess, Imri, correct me if I'm wrong, we're seeing about this 10 to 15 percent immovable space within apartments, for example, who are just happy with a mobile connection. And that's what will grow with 5G. And no matter what we do and almost whatever prices we kind of throw at them, um, they're not willing to kind of move over. And this is where, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the larger converged players, because let's not forget that whilst TM is a dominant player in the fixed space, Maxis is a dominant player in the mobile space. So the larger, so the larger kind of players like Maxis who are doing uh, 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 a form of convergence benefit because they're able to tie in a product of uh, both fixed and wireless across uh, multiple things. So it's important that as players, we provide consumers with a suite of services that they need. Not everyone will want fixed broadband. And that's, a, that's, that's, that's something that we've realized. You're absolutely right. right? It's all about providing that menu of connectivity for the, for the customers to choose. Um, you know, just like to share some customer insights as well. Right? Um, it was not too long ago, was it about one and a half years ago, right? Um, TM, we did, we did a door-to-door -door in terms of customer canvassing to really understand the, uh, the preferences, the profile, the insights on the ground. And um, those of you here in KL will be familiar with this place. This is in Shah Alam, uh, Bukit Jelutong, in Shah Alam, right? To our great surprise, right? So it's not a question of affordability, but it's a choice. We're out of the uh, residential homes, 20% decided not to take a fixed broadband. And those who decided was a mix of TM, there was, there was Maxis, and yeah, Afzal, you're, you're not in there. Uh, <laughs> right? So, so, so it is that choice, right? And as we move on further away from those areas, you know, that, that percentage of, of choice gets a bit more and more, right? Yeah. As we move towards the suburban as well as to rural, right? Uh, so, it's, it's, it's really a choice, yeah? It, so it's really hard or difficult or unfair to just really look at what is the take up of fixed broadband, this, you know, of the household fixed broadband penetration, sure. because if you look from the lens of the customers, it is, it is a choice of them, if either a fixed broadband or a mobile. Thank and you. Prem, just to, yeah. just to kind of, just, just, just one last plug, and we all have different roles in the industry, right? Our role at time is to irritate Telecom Malaysia um, as best we can uh, by reducing prices and increasing speeds so that they feel under pressure to do the same. That's the role of a challenger. We, you know, we should take market share from there. And their role is to bully us back by providing far better call center and customer service, uh, which actually they do, um, you know, as compared to where we are. So we've got the better product, I think. They've got the better service backbone. So, I mean, these are things, I mean, and that's why we work in a, in, in a kind of competitive environment, so we kind of spur each other on. So, we will continue being the lipas that will irritate Telecom Malaysia, right? And they'll continue stomping on us so they become fitter. That's the, that's the analogy <laughs> I would use. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Afzal yeah. and Imri. Uh -huh. Dr. Fazlo, any last <clears throat> comments on yeah, pricing? That, that's precisely why I talked about uh, competition. Okay, yeah. you you have very colourful characters, uh, you know, uh, running the telco businesses. Uh, you got a very big lipas uh, in a, in this form of Afzal. Okay, he's a, he's the biggest of all. Okay, uh, but he likes to call himself the friendly lipas. Okay, uh, and this is where uh, demand will determine choice. Okay, so hence we we keep talking about fakes and we keep talking about mobile. In reality. Both are just as important to us as users. Okay? Moving forward, we'll probably see a situation where you have more fixed mobile convergence offering to, to end users. Okay? Where then people will then decide, am I a heavy data user 
Therefore, I need to do my gymnastics on a fixed line uh, as opposed to doing my gymnastics on a mobile line because you probably can't do as much uh, on a mobile line per se because the level of uh, speed that you get on a mobile will always be limited simply by the law of physics. Okay? So hence, moving forward the, for the country, that would be the way that people will consume. Demand will dictate. Uh, prices, I think the market is uh, astute enough to decide what is right uh, with a little bit of prod and push by the government from time to time, uh, especially to, uh, to ensure that those in the B40 uh, would be uh, able to subscribe to, uh, to that. But we must also appreciate the analogy of, auto of the automotive industry. You want to get from point A to point B, okay, you have a variety of options, right? You can either have a car, a very expensive car, or you can have a car, a very cheap car, or you actually have a, motorcycle, a motorbike, a very expensive motorbike for some, and a very cheap motorbike, uh, the cup chais. Okay? And for, for those, for some, even a bicycle will be good enough. Although I do know of people paying uh, for a bicycle as expensive as a cheapest car, but no, bottom line is you have the choice of bicycle, a motorcycle, and a car to get from point A to point B. So likewise in uh, connectivity, you again have those uh, options and therefore people must appreciate that you cannot expect uh, to, to get from point A to point B at a very high speed or a high performance but wanting to pay only for the bicycle. Okay, so there, there must be a fair trade-off in terms of cost and what you hope to get from that type of purchase. Okay, so I think the market today is mature. Uh, my parting words would be, as I said to the industry, you are the guys who will shape how people think. That's what marketing is all about. Therefore, an education by the industry is very, very important. And I'm pleased to let everyone know that they have stepped up. And in fact, uh, we are having you know, a whole communication plan led by the industry to make sure that the consumers and the businesses understand what, is, what sort of services will be required for what sort of demand that they will have. Okay, so that at least uh, we will all uh, move ahead uh, in a very rational manner as much as possible. Thank you very much, Dr. Fazl, and thank you very much, uh, Imri and Afzal, for joining us today. I've been warned that we are over time already, right? I think uh, we've at least achieved from this session that there is a sensible regulatory environment for the telcos here in Malaysia. Pricing options available for SMEs and consumers alike to maximize their usage uh, wants. And most importantly, we are not going to have a situation where the industry goes into tailspin chasing the next big word or next phrase, catchphrase in the industry at the expense of stakeholders. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.